who seem to understand the mysteries of the universe? Well, let me tell you about my uncle. Picture this scene. Summers in a New Hampshire farm, surrounded by family, and there stood my uncle, a soft-spoken genius with bushy eyebrows. He was an MIT physics professor for four decades. And then he was awarded over 60 patents after the age of 70. OMG. Yes, please, please. Um, but what I remember most was his ability to explain things with such clarity that even a child could grasp, like why the sky is blue, or how light ping-ponging inside a raindrop can become a rainbow. But long before there was an internet to answer all our questions, he was my personal internet. Um, my uncle made me realize that I also wanted to be able to explain things. So I pursued a PhD in physics from MIT. Uh, then I pursued a career in clean energy. But that work hit a wall of water on August 29, 2005 when Hurricane Katrina made landfall and flooded my brother's home in past Christian, Mississippi, which was walloped with a 28-foot storm surge. I admired my brother because he became a doctor. Uh, he healed people. I was uncomfortable when people called me Dr. Rome because he was the real Dr. Rome. My brother said his house looked like it had been through a washing machine, with all his possessions soaked in water and turned upside down. We were all in shock. But a few weeks later, talking on the phone, he asked me a question that would change the course of my life. He asked, Joe, should I rebuild my home? Wow, that threw me. I I didn't know the answer, but I was supposed to be able to explain things. And I had to give my brother the best possible answer. So that became my mission. I, I started talking to every scientist I could. I started reading countless studies. And what I learned uh, surprised me. First, uh, things were more dire than I realized. Uh, yes, we were going to see many more Katrinas because Greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide were heating up the oceans, and the hotter the water, the worse the hurricanes. But I also learned that scientists and the media needed to do a much better job of explaining things. Since we are on track to leave our children a ruined climate, and that is not defensible. So I decided to become a full-time communicator a nonprofit in the nation's capital, helped me set up the Climate Progress blog. Uh, my friends thought I got a bit obsessed because I wrote 2,000 articles over the next decade. Um, uh, but I learned many more uh, surprising things. Uh, and in 2009, Rolling Stone uh, named me one of 100 people who are reinventing America. Uh, the, yeah. uh, though I must say, I'm still figuring out how to reinvent the climate crisis. Um, but first, let me assure you, this is not a talk about politics, uh, although I did learn the definition of the word politics when I was at the Department of Energy three decades ago. Uh, it comes from the Greek poly, meaning many, and ticks, meaning small blood-sucking insects. <laughs> Perhaps the most surprising thing I learned is that we know the solution to climate change and we have known it for a long time. But we are being distracted by sexy strategies like hydrogen energy or carbon offsets that offer little hope of much help for decades. Here is our real challenge. The main cause of climate change is burning coal, oil, and natural gas which released vast amounts of quantities of 
carbon dioxide. CO2 is a heat-trapping gas that acts like a blanket over the Earth. The more coal, oil, and gas we burn, the bigger the blanket gets. But we are emitting 50 billion tons of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere each year. And that is a big blanket. And we, as a result, need to have solutions that can get as big as the blanket. Um, and the science also says that we need to reduce emissions to near zero by 2050. So we have to get very big, very fast, and that limits our options. If the world had started reducing emissions when we started having annual meetings to address the problem, things would be much easier. But we dawdled. Uh, how many meetings? Dawdle, 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 and dawdled. And when you dawdle that long, there are consequences. And one of the consequences is that we all need to work together now to rapidly deploy technologies that are already successful, like solar power, wind power, batteries for storage, electric cars instead of gasoline ones, and electric heat pumps instead of natural gas ones. We have dawdled too long to wait for technologies that still need a breakthrough to become commercial, like fusion or hydrogen energy or small nuclear reactors or uh, direct air capture of CO2. Yes, research in those uh, may pay off someday, but we have to keep our eyes on the prize, and that is rapidly reducing emissions this decade using uh, existing solutions. Another flawed strategy is carbon offsets, where people or a company pays someone else to cut their pollution so we don't have to cut ours. Uh, carbon offsets are like uh, paying someone else to exercise for you. Um, <laughs> when you buy an airplane ticket, you're often offered the chance to offset the emissions for a few dollars. But if cutting CO2 cost that little, uh, climate change would not be a problem, and I would be up here talking about uh, Taylor Swift. With so many strategies that don't make sense, you may be asking, what does it make sense for you to do? Well, how about a way to help the climate and your kids at the same time with electric heat pumps? Heat pumps extract outside heat, uh, he air, uh, heat from outside air, even cold air, and bring it inside. They can even provide cooling. Uh, heat pumps are so efficient that they uh, outsold gas boilers in 2023. Uh, they can be used in our homes, offices, and factories. But they can also be used in our schools to help provide cleaner, healthier air, which would be a game changer for our kids because the Environmental Protection Agency says bad air in schools can make our kids sick. And the EPA also reports that kids in classrooms with good ventilation tend to score higher on standardized tests than those with bad ventilation. But instead of giving our kids the best ventilated air, a 2020 government study found that a shocking 36,000 schools need to fix or replace their heating and cooling systems. That means millions of our kids routinely breathe bad air for no good reason. I studied green building design for three decades when I helped uh, run the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of Energy. 
we know that new heat pumps and filters can provide much cleaner inside air. But schools are chronically underfunded, and it's become too easy for them to take money from the budget for new equipment. So what is the solution? Moms, dads, educators, and all of us who care about our kids need to take action. First, become informed. The EPA website has everything you need to know about the problem and the solution. Second, demand action from school boards and administrators. If your school has an ancient ventilation system, get it replaced. New incentives make heat pumps more cost-effective than ever. But many actions don't cost much money. Low-cost CO2 monitors in classrooms would tell the teacher when the air is bad, and then they just have to open the windows, if possible. The teacher should also keep the doors open between classes to flush out the air. So solving climate change doesn't just mean fewer Katrinas, it means cleaner, healthier air for all of us. And as we build a world where our children can all breathe easier, let's remember the words of the great climate rule breaker, Greta Thunberg. We can't save the world playing by the rules, because the rules have to be changed. Everything needs to change, and it has to start today. Thank you.